Watch this. Testing for COVID-19. To this point, it's been about who has it. We've now entered the phase of who has had it. We take a look at antibody testing, what it is and what is it good for. A group of vandals are working together to help All right, well, last week, Crush the Curve Idaho, the nonprofit with Dr. Tommy Alquist as the front man, announced in addition to offering COVID-19 testing to anyone who wants it, they would also be offering antibody testing to anyone who wants to pay for it. That's the test to determine if you ever had coronavirus and your body happened to build up immunities or antibodies, I should say, to fight it. Not immunities, but antibodies to fight it off. At about the same time, Dr. David Pate, who is on the state coronavirus working group, took to Twitter to warn Idahoans, as you can see here, that a positive antibody test likely false. Well, that Twitter feud hit its stride Friday night with Dr. Alquist questioning whether Dr. Pate's comments were genuine. Dr. Pate saying he wasn't trying to make this personal. And then Dr. Alquist asking, well, then why is this escalating over Twitter? Well, so we reached out to both of them today to ask about this antibody testing and why we should or shouldn't be putting stock into it. But first, we're going to get over to Joe Paris because it's supposed to be a perfect test, the one that Tommy Alquist, Dr. Tommy Alquist, is purporting. But what is that perfect test supposed to tell us? To understand that, Joe Paris asked about or asked another expert about the value of doing some antibody testing. Yeah, Brian, we've gotten a lot of questions about antibody testing. So today I spoke with Dr. Ken Cornell. Ken is a doctor, uh, excuse me, he's a PhD at Boise State. He studies biochemistry. And one of his areas of research is looking at antibiotics. So he's very familiar with everything going on right now. Today we talked about antibody testing, what it is and what it's valuable for. Here's what Dr. Cornell has to say about it. In the case of coronavirus, what is antibody testing useful for? Uh, the antibody testing for coronavirus is going to be most valuable is in looking at how much of the population was actually exposed. A patient who doesn't show clinical signs of disease, they may have circulating antibodies that would tell you that they were exposed. And why is that information useful? How does that help? That can tell you then, um, as a population, um, how many people got exposed versus how many people came down with clinical disease. The antibody test is not going to uh, help you one day after you've been exposed to the virus. It's going to take um, several weeks for you to mount a significant amount of antibody response um, for it to be detectable. There was a concern that um, maybe um, that the, there would be false positives on the antibody tests. There's a handful of different coronaviruses circulating. Uh, that they might cross-react, and um, that turns out uh, it, it, that doesn't look like that's the case. Well, a lot has also been made about the sensitivity of the test. Some are 96% accurate, some are 99.9% .9 accurate. Is there a threshold that should be met to using these tests? Is 96% as good as 99% in this case, or is that like a world apart? Uh, no, those are not a world apart. From my perspective, both of those are pretty similar and, and actually remarkably good considering that we're going after something that we've only known about for a few months. Something's better than nothing in terms of percentage-wise? Oh, certainly. Um, but understand, too, what the purpose of this antibody test is going to be. What is the most useful part about these antibody tests? Um, Who has been exposed in the population as a whole? And then you can compare that to rates of who actually came down with um, clinical symptoms. If we see that we have a very large uh, number of the population that has a positive antibody response, that means that they mounted enough of an immune response that they will have these circulating antibodies around. Um, that we have a large population that actually has antibodies, then we can be more secure that we're past the worst of the pandemic. question is how long these kind of tests take. And Brian, to when we talk about the antibody testing, another question has been about 
yeah, how long does it take for, uh, for the results to come through? They come through very quickly. Um, they can take a matter of minutes. Dr. Cornell telling me they really shouldn't take longer than a matter of hours. Sometimes, you know, they do get backed up. There could be a backlog. But the test itself, Brian, very quick. All right, I know the information is valuable, uh, but it's how it's used. That's kind of the determining factor on what people do with this information. We'll get to more of that uh, when we get to this story or the interview that I had with both Dr. Pate and Dr. Alquist. That's coming up in just a bit. In fact, we can do it. Uh, am, am I told we got this uh, ready for us right now? Oh, okay, well, anyway, we'll get to that in just a second. But what we are going to talk about is, aside from testing, whether that's for COVID-19, antibodies, or otherwise, you know what would be better than finding out who has it or if they're safe to go back to work? A cure. Finding a cure would be better, right? Well, did you know work is underway right here in Idaho right now to find a cure for coronavirus? Kim Fields talked with the two of the researchers at the University of Idaho to learn more. We've all seen the picture by now of what coronavirus looks like, shaped like a ball with little spikes on it. When a person becomes infected, those spikes latch onto the surfaces of throat and lung cells. The infected cells then replicate millions and millions of times. Jagdish Patel and his team at the University of Idaho hopes to create a drug that shields human cells from those spikes. Most research across the country is focusing on finding drugs to attack the actual coronavirus or the ball and spikes. But the University of Idaho is approaching it the other way by protecting cells from being invaded in the first place. It is definitely exciting uh, considering, I mean, this kind of research has not come out of Idaho. It's not all, uh, it's not frequent that somebody's working on this kind of a project where somebody's actually coming up with a cure. And from a scientific point of view, uh, we are excited because our approach has not been explored in detail yet. Our approach would uh, serve as a backup strategy for if for some reason the vaccines are, uh, would not work. My background is, is in HIV research um, and there's already uh, one marketable therapeutic on available for treating HIV and it's called Mavirox. Now that is, is a similar kind of strategy that we're taking in the fact that it behaves like a shield to protect individual cells from attack by HIV, so the human immunodeficiency virus. So in our approach, we, we figured that that would be a reasonable way to um, target coronavirus and protect human cells as well. I, for me, I feel very, very excited about this. Um, my whole lab has moved and, and changed direction from studying HIV um, and moved wholeheartedly to, to study coronaviruses, adapting all the systems that we've worked very hard on the last few years to develop and now using them now to fight a current um, very important pandemic with hope to, to generate some leads in the future. Patel says drugs targeting human cells as opposed to viruses are likely to be effective for a longer period of time. It also has the potential of protecting us from other coronaviruses, like those that cause mild to severe respiratory infections. Well, doctors Patel and Rowley hopeful of finding a potential lead or a couple of them within a year. Within a year, and that's only going to be leads. We're not looking for a cure within a year. Their findings, though, would then go before the FDA for approval, which could take several more years after that to get the uh, final approval. Still, it's promising research that's happening in our own backyard, and it's happening at the University of Idaho. All right, going back to the story with Dr. Tommy Alquist and Dr. David Pate. If you happened to watch Twitter last week, you saw this feud kind of escalate a little bit between the two. Dr. Tommy Alquist saying, we have the test kits for antibody testing and we want to offer them to the, anybody that wants to come and take them. It's going to cost you about $100. Dr. David Pate, on the other hand, said, well, that's great. There's some question of the validity of it, but there's also a question of what we do with this information once we have it. Does that mean that we just set everybody free if they have antibodies? Not so fast. We reached out to both of them today to ask about this antibody testing and why we should or shouldn't be putting a whole lot of stock in it. So this is on a full machine where we're actually drawing people's blood, spinning it down, sending the plasma through the machine, and it will tell you with 100% accuracy on sensitivity and 99.6% on specificity whether or not you have antibodies for COVID-19. 
Okay, so last week you said 96%, is that correct? Th yes, so what's happened, so just so you know, the official press release came out Friday and it's 100 and 99.6. Those are the numbers. So the people that are getting tested today, we will be able to tell them with those two numbers, 100% and 99.6%, do you have the antibody for uh, COVID-19? Sensitivity, meaning can it pick up even small traces of COVID-19? And specificity, meaning can it rule it out if you don't? Hey, Brian. Some, like Dr. David Pate, who is part of the state's COVID-19 working group, is worried it won't rule out false hope. Well, I, I think that's helpful to know, but that doesn't answer the fundamental question. And that question is, if you have a positive antibody test, first of all, what's the chance that it's truly positive? And then the second question is, uh, if it really is positive, um, are you immune? And uh, nobody knows the answer to that question. I agree. And we're not telling people that this is some stamp of approval. You can go back to your life the way it was. That is not the messaging. You still have to be careful. You're still going to have to, we're still going to have to walk through this together. This is going to be something that's going to evolve. Why then is antibody testing so important in this next phase of fighting coronavirus? So think about the tools we have in a toolbox to help fight it, right? One of those tools are, do you have it right now? But the second part is, have you had the test in the last several weeks? And the other thing about knowing whether you've had the test or not is remember, some of the studies coming out are showing that up to 50 or 60 percent of people are completely asymptomatic. Well, that matters. That matters, says Dr. Alquist, when it comes to getting people back to work. But Dr. Pate says it's not nearly enough. I'm not suggesting to anybody that we wait for a perfect test. What I'm saying, if you want to stop taking precautions or if your employer is thinking that we can treat you differently because you have a positive antibody test and not give you the same protections as somebody else, we do need to wait a long time to make sure that we've got good data before we put those people at risk. There's the question of, okay, how much should we trust these tests? But you're saying doing something is better than nothing? I'm saying something different than that. I'm saying there will never be a better test than this, ever. This is with the University of Washington Virology Department. So the argument they've said to start antibody testing is to wait till there's a better test. We're there. This is the best test we will have or ever will have. So the question I would ask back is when do you want to start testing for antibodies? Dr. Pate told me the state not currently using antibody test results to determine what we will do next, but they will soon be starting a new testing task force that they will explore just that. And yes, there are some questions about the validity of some of these antibody tests that are out there with the FDA relaxing the rules to get more out on the market. Well, Dr. Alquist assures me this test that he's using and his group is using does not fall under that. The tests that they are using are the same ones as you heard him mention the University of Washington Virology Lab is using. And while it may not have a full-fledged FDA approval yet, Dr. Alquist told me it's the same test machine used to gauge other test machines, meaning it's the gold standard. COVID test results in less than four hours? Well, one hospital says they can do it thanks to a new in-house laboratory. And you asked, will Boise open back up by May? It depends on how you define open. Speaking of questions, feel free to text us yours. The number 208-321-5614. Be sure to include your name and the hashtag the 208. We're going to answer some of them later in the show.
More good news when it comes to the coronavirus and it falls back under the testing category. Gone are the days of waiting up to two weeks to get test results back. Now, thanks to new technology, St. Luke's laboratories say they can turn COVID-19 test results even faster in about two to four hours. Until recently, all tests done at St. Luke's had to be sent to other labs like the Idaho State Lab, the University of Washington Medical Center or the University of Utah. And that was about a three day turnaround on average at best. Before that, tests were sent to large commercial labs that took more than eight days to return results. So what did those labs have that St. Luke's didn't have? What's well, called a regent. It's a substance that's also been in short supply at late. It's a substance with a short lifespan that's key to the testing. In the last few months, the Department of Defense limited which organizations could have regent, which based on location, population, need and hot spots. But recently, St. Luke's core laboratory received enough of the regent to test the reagent, excuse me, to test two of its instruments and begin running COVID-19 tests. Labs in Boise, Twin Falls, Ketchum, Meridian, Nampa and McCall also have instruments up and running patient tests. Their goal is to be able to stop sending those tests to outside labs today and by May, St. Luke says their labs will be able to process more than 1700 COVID tests a day. This coming Wednesday is going to mark four weeks under Idaho's statewide stay at home order. Back on March 25th, Governor Brad Little issued an order as uh, the confirmed community spread of the coronavirus hit areas like Blaine County, Ada County and even Canyon County. After four weeks of doing our part by staying at home, it's yeah, getting a little restless for a lot of people out there. It's getting a little restless for some of you as well, like Jana, who posted this question to our 208 Facebook group. Brian, it sounds like after May 1st, bars, salons and dining will still be a no go open for business. Is that right to open for business? They won't be doing that. Well, that's kind of what we're going to determine when we get to April 30th. Unfortunately, Jana, right now there are no answers as to when non essential businesses like salons and bars and in store in house dining will open back up. Idaho's current statewide stay at home order expires at the end of this month, which is April 30th. You may remember that order was originally for just three weeks, so it is possible that it could be extended again, but there may be a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. According to a model of the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, Idaho passed its peak back on April 10th. Predictions by that model alone mean the gem state could begin to ease some of our social distancing measures after May 11th if and that's a big if containment strategies are in place. That includes testing, contact tracing, isolation and limiting gathering sizes. But again, the ultimate decisions can be up to state officials like Governor Little. And he's listening to a whole crew of people. Even if Idaho's statewide order is lifted, cities can still issue social distancing ordinances like the city of Boise did prior to the March 25th statewide order. So while it's great to be optimistic, it's probably better to be a little bit more realistic. What are you staring at? No, not you. I'm talking to these googly eyed masked bushes outside of this Boise Elementary School. What are they doing there? Do you have a question? Maybe you have a complaint or just want to talk. You can do any of those just by sending us a text message 208 321 5614. Make sure to include your name in the hashtag the 208. Be warned though, we read some of these, but only the best ones at the end of the show.
Spring sunshine and warm temperatures across southern Idaho into the 70s throughout the Treasure Valley, mid 60s down in the Magic Valley and mid 50s for our mountain locations. Now high pressure is in control for us right now. That's that big blue H sinking, subsiding air, keeping the clouds at bay. But we look out into the ocean and you see some moisture that's headed in our direction for the middle of the week. Sunshine and 70s again tomorrow. But then that changes as we cruise through the day on Wednesday. More cloud cover in place through the day, though it looks like the wet weather may hold off until the afternoon or evening hours. And then scattered showers continue into Thursday morning, both days, Wednesday and Thursday, breezy to even locally windy. Tonight, though, clear and calm. Great night to view the Leard meteor showers if that's on your list for things to do, 39 to 44. And then tomorrow in the Treasure Valley, 71 to 76. We do it all over again with sunshine and a bit of a breeze. Here's a look at our highs that are expected around the southern part of the state, mid to upper 50s for our mountain locations, and we're looking for low to mid 70s for the Treasure Valley. Wind gust tomorrow, not all that impressive, but still, as I mentioned before, a breezy day. Day, could get up to 25 mile per hour wind gusts in the afternoon. And this is a look at the seven day forecast. A little blip in the radar as we move into Wednesday and Thursday with some spring showers on the way and another warm up in store for next weekend. You can always find this forecast at ktvb.com and we'll be right back. All right, students all over the state, they've been out of class for more than a month. A month without the normal routines, the regular structure, their teachers. Well, most are still getting their homework done and are able to see their teachers and classmates through Zoom or Skype every day. It doesn't replace the connections made inside the classroom. So teachers at Cynthia Mann Elementary School in Boise, they came up with a way to show their students that even though they're not physically together, they're still offering up some life lessons through signs of encouragement. Today's What's Your Sign? Outside the classroom, it started with Principal Jeff Farley asking his staff to come up with a way to show support to their students and the neighborhood because a lot of them live around the school. So teachers like Kim Carlisle and Jennifer Graining did, decided to get creative, as you can see. Look at this. They draped recycled bed sheets over bushes in front of the school, then added googly eyes to bring life to them. So all those bushes start to look like little bugs and monsters of some sort, right? 
In front of them, they're put up some colorful signs like hang in there, take care of each other. We can do hard things. Granning says they just want their students and families to know that we miss them. And hopefully this can also make them smile. Farley added that the response has been overwhelming, not only from students and parents, but from the entire community around Cynthia Mann Elementary. We'll be right back. All right, let's wrap up the 2A with a look at some of your comments you sent in during the show today. First one, Brian, can mosquitoes carry the COVID-19 virus and transmit it? This is Josh Martin setting that one in. Well, like a lot of things with COVID-19, yet to be determined. That uh, That's still a kind of an unknown, but they are a blood transfusion kind of thing, so I'm going to have to wait and see on that one. Hi, right, Brian, please tell me why tennis courts are closed, but it's okay to golf when there are more possibilities for contagion via golfing. I, like, for example, two in a cart. That's from Joan. Well, Joan, I think on the golf course, you're not allowed to touch any other golfer's stuff, right? So whether you're in a cart or walking, you're not really in that spot. But you're playing tennis, somebody's hitting a ball to you that you eventually have to pick up with your hand and hit it back to them. But that's just kind of my own uh, speculation on that one. How can they identify a symptomatic carrier if the only way to get a test is if you exhibit symptoms? This seems like a failure. I don't have $100 for an antibody test. Right now, though, at Salter Medical Group, he says they can offer tests to anybody that wants it. You don't have to show a whole lot of symptoms to do that, so check that out. Great grandson wants to know, does the tooth fairy have to stay home or can he still do his job? Just has to wear a mask. 